All right, Todd, I'm ready to train the uh, gun retention. Dude, what are, what are you doing? It's unloaded, bro. I don't care. Go get a dummy gun, man. What are you doing? You don't need that gun. Get out of here. Come on. We're not training until you're back. You're right. So, guys, if you're following along with this series, we don't use these real guns for training. You can get a completely inert, it's a hunk of plastic. We don't even call these training guns. They're inert training tools uh, for all of the obvious reasons, but because sometimes common sense isn't so common, do not train any of this stuff with a real weapon. You can buy an analog to your gun. They're 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks online. You should have it anyway because you can do a lot of good dry player stuff with these and it's completely safe. Don't train with the real thing. Oh, hey guys. So back again with Mr. Todd Fox, working on retaining your weapon. If you're a copper, security expert, legally armed citizen, all of these things matter. So what are we working on today, Mr. Fox? We're gonna hit the ground. First thing we're gonna do is start talking about why we don't wanna go to the ground with weapons or in general, right? It's kind of weird for a competitive black belt in jujitsu to say don't go to the ground, but that's the smart play, don't go to the ground. The reasons why we don't wanna to go to the ground, one is the surface space that we're training on right now is a nice, soft, cushy, carry trainer mat. And this feels nice when you hit it. But if we just move over a few inches here, I can guarantee you that he nor I wanna hit the ground here. So surface mm -mm. space is a big problem when we talk about fighting on the ground separate from weapon retention. It's just worse with a weapon and any type of duty gear or, or kit on. Next, one of the things that happens on the ground is proximity to weapons. So he gets proximity to my weapon systems. Me having proximity to his is not so much a problem for me, but him having access to mine on the ground is a problem. One thing that Mick can do is close his guard here, and guess what happens? Circle, 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 circle. Now, when I want to extract my weapon here, I'm going to have a bit of a problem taking it out because of his leg, okay? So that's a problem for me. And also, if he starts to control it and he puts this knee up here, put it up here, and now he has access under, grab my weapon, yeah. Right. So now he has access to my weapon, it's going to be hard for me to defend it, okay? So proximity no. to I played this with you before. <laughs> proximity to weapons is a problem, right? Another problem. Whether I'm in a good or bad position on Mick, if I'm on the side of him and I'm controlling him in any sort of way, right, I can't see, so my sight lines are shit. I can't see over around cars, I can't see through windows. Bob, come help me, this yeah. cop's on top of me, kick him in the head. And if I'm on the bottom, it's the same thing. My sight lines are horrible. So sight lines are a big problem, right? So we talked about already surface space, we talked about proximity to weapons, him to mine. We talk about sight lines. Elevation is another big thing. When I'm fighting, I want elevation, and most people know this. Another thing that's critical here is mobility. I don't have the ability to quickly disengage from being down on the ground, even if I'm in a good spot. The best I can hope for in terms of grappling or jujitsu would be to be in a knee and belly type position where I can semi-quickly disengage. But standing up here, I can disengage very, very quickly. Okay, this is good for me, I have mobility. So those are the problems with fighting on the ground. So we don't really wanna fight on the ground when we don't have to. And again, very weird, black belt telling you why not to fight on the ground. So what I'm hearing from a three stripe, almost four stripe black belt, national champion, MMA fighter, protection expert, learn to fight on the ground, but don't seek to go there. Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. Okay. You learn it because you don't want to be there and you don't want to stay there and you want to have a solution to that potential problem. Okay. So what are we going to work on? All right, so let's start here. We hit the ground and I'm going to start in a bad spot. So the, the thing is, I really don't want to be on my back. Yes, I fight jujitsu, but I don't want to be on my back. That's not a spot, right? I, again, mobility and elevation will favor the guy on top. So if I'm on the ground, and I'm down, one of the key concepts for me is gonna be to lay on my gun, right? Meaning here, because now I'm taking away access for me, but I'm really taking away access for him. If I'm laying on it, this gun's not coming out. So I'm gonna lay on it. I still have my hands, I still have my feet, I can still move around. Give me that gun, 
controlling the gun or controlling the gun, right? This is problematic for some guys because a lot of guys are training their strong side up. So for example, if I'm doing something like a jujitsu scissor sweep and I'm coming here, look at where my gun is at. I'm feeding him my gun. This is problematic. So now, if, if I'm trained this way, I have to train the opposite, which means now I've got to come to the other side, okay? So, on the ground, lay down on the gun. Sometimes you screw up. Sometimes you don't lay on the gun, or sometimes you fall into a position where you can't lay on the gun, or his arm is under you. So, the next thing that we want to talk about doing, and let's go this way, Mickey, come on this side. The next thing we're talking about doing is trying to underhook your weapon. So if you have an exposed weapon, no matter how it is, whether it's on a duty belt, some type of, of gunfighter belt, if it's on uh, you know, an external holster, is we're gonna underhook. And how we wanna underhook it is we make a thin blade with our hand and we come underneath and underhook, like you're flexing your bicep. Once I turn it in this way, it's gonna be hard for Mickey to extract it because he's gonna have to pull it through my body. Mm -hmm. So I wanna be able to defend and create space and do things here, but I have this underhook so the weapon's not coming out. So if he starts to get hands on it, I wanna get that out quick. Now, once we're here, yeah, he's gonna have to start doing that. And look, I can still utilize my hand with the underhook. They used to teach in the old days, pulling the gun up like this, the problem is I can't use my hand anymore. I really want to wedge my arm underneath because I can start it. to control and I still have control of the weapon, yeah. okay? So this is not bad because I still have a free hand to do things with. Let's say I have my knife that I can access or a secondary backup weapon that I can access. That's great, this still works. But ideally, I want to underhook and I want to do just like I'm doing a curl, a bicep curl here and pull the weapon into me. So that basically, as you see it turning in here, it's impossible to extract. I'm here. So no matter how hard he tries, he's not gonna not only have access to it, but look, I can start to do things here, and I can create my space and positioning and then maybe get to my gun. Fake. So, first thing, following on your gun, when you can lay on your gun and get to a more advantageous position. Second thing, underhooking of the weapon system so that it can't be extracted. Another thing is gonna be, trying to stay on your gun, and while you're on your gun, here, this guy's coming into me, I wanna be able to frame on him somehow, some way. In jujitsu and in fighting, typically underhooks are what I want, but when he's coming in, I don't have time, so what's gonna happen is, as I frame on him here, I wanna put something between us, right? If I can, I put a knee in, right? And that's gonna give me space because I can push him away and access my weapon when I need it. But sometimes that doesn't happen. And as we're in here and he's into me, I need to be able to get up. So as I drive, see this elbow right here? Relax, lift up. This elbow is gonna frame on Mick here. And this is basically gonna turn sideways so that I can pull this elbow under my body. When it's pulled under my body, it's indexing on my weapon. So as I'm controlling here, I'm gonna be able to pull my elbow back and slide my shin and my sound. Bam, here we are, framed on him. Elbows into him, I'm controlling here at his bicep, okay? And my elbow's coming underneath me. At this point, I can make a frame back. Now I've got a column, and now my shin is gonna slide under my butt here. And at this point, I can access my weapon to take the shot if I need to and or I can stand straight up. So technical get up, stand in base, 101. 101. With the gun. With the gun is what it is. So I can try to create that frame and control the hips to separate us, yes. It's gonna be hard for you to do anything from here. Or if you've closed that gap, I can try to double bicep cup here. And from here, if I can get this, if I can control this, this foot is gonna push off the ground, this elbow is gonna come underneath me, slide back, I can easily stand up at this point. Black belt shit. Now, let's say we start talking about getting into a guard type position. From the guard, generally speaking, I wanna control your head and your tricep. If my gun was on the other side, I'd control here, and in reality, I would control here without a gun because he's probably right-handed. 87% of the population 
is right-handed. So you're just taking a gamble on that. Makes sense. I would do this. However, I don't simply because my gun's over there and I don't want that hand working for my gun. Okay. So when he gets to that point, you can simply underhook or pull, whichever you want to do, and the gun's not going to come out. But we can go back to our standing techniques from here as well, where I control his wrist. And once I control his wrist, I'm going to use my knee to feed me his elbow. So I control his head so that he can't posture up, and I bring my knee to my chest. Boom. Once this happens, now I can thread and go into Kimura's here. Okay. Also, I have the ability to extract my weapon here. With this hand, I hook here, and now I can take a shot. A couple things that I'm thinking about just as we're being a little light, lightly aggressive, you got to have a really good belt, right? Like go buy some flimsy synthetic leather belt just doing some of this stuff, you're probably gonna break it. You've gotta have attachment points that are not gonna break. You've got, everything's gotta be robust or something's gonna break. Agreed. I mean, because we could even break this if we got crazy. Something will break, but um, it will take a lot of around. And of course, guys, as we're talking about this, some of you out of the gate are saying, well, I don't carry a duty belt. Remember what we told you in video one, we're starting with outside the waistband to develop a understanding of the concepts and techniques because it's also gonna be a lot easier for you to see this as well. So don't, don't get wrapped around the axle on the fact that you might not use this gear. Yeah, some of, some of the concepts actually are easy to adjust to in that conceptually, if I'm underhooking the weapon and turning it in and he can't extract it, the same general concept can happen from appendix because anytime that I'm bent in here, he can't extract the weapon this way. Can where we it's show them your tummy? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so here, coming forward, I'll even bring it up. The gun can't come out this way. It's going to have to fold back in order to come out. So we'll, Which, get, we'll get to that. Okay, I don't want to get ahead of the... But I want to make sure that you guys listening don't start thinking like, eh, this isn't the way I carry a gun. It's not. It's concepts. And if you learn the concepts first, then you can apply it to your method of carry. Walk, crawl, run. Run, crawl, I'll crawl walk. first, and you, then I'll walk, you. and then I'll run. For me. <laughs> you, something different. <laughs> All right, so where are we at? All right, so... Now, another thing, the same thing that we did before, when we have this situation, and let's say we underhooked and it worked or didn't work, and maybe he's grabbing it here and I'm having an issue, the same concept that worked before, where we were framing and we slid over to a guillotine, the same thing works again. So just lift this shoulder up a little bit. See this hand, this hand right here? It's gonna make a little fist, and I'm gonna bring my shoulder forward here. And then now I'm gonna curve my body and lift my hips, and it's gonna start to put a choke onto Mickey. I've had one issue, let's just say I couldn't bump this forward and he's got it back tight. Instead of continuing to attack this, I'm just gonna take this hand and slide over and around, okay? And at this point, as I arch and do this, he's probably gonna let go of that and if he doesn't, right, then I'll take care of it for him. Okay, now we're back into this spot. If this, then that. Yes. If that, then this. Yeah. So uh, uh, similar to a pace plan, right? Primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. I've got a primary plan and three backup plans. And so that's what I want to do with all of these movements. I want to have options. I want to create options and then I want to train those options and then I want to train with stress. Retain the gun. Don't give them access to the gun. If they are starting to get access to the gun, keep the gun then go into attacks is kind of where we're seeing this. So the gun comes out because I chose to bring it out at the wrong time or you got it out, right? So here's, here's the situation that we were in before, right? But now we're down because if we were standing, what happened? I controlled the head. Damn it. So when you have that, even there, doesn't matter. So here, I'm gonna control the head, and I put my shin there. As I push my shin, it's a two-fro motion. I push my shin, pull his head, and pull the gun. And then now I've got what I need. And guys, he's going at probably 30%, maybe 40%. It's, I mean, I could give him more, but it's just gonna hurt my hands 
and suck. So if you were going 70, 100%, that gun's ripping out of my hand. Yeah, that front sight sucks. So if you're doing this and you're doing it ad nauseum, you're repping it 100, 200, 300, 500 times, you might want to consider having gloves on because it's going to tear your hands up. Ask me how I know. <laughs> so the idea would be you came in here and I'm blocking this and I'm trying to control this forward and I'm not able to get it, right? So let's, see, let's try to miss this. And as I miss, yeah, as I miss this, you're kind of going up and I'm going to switch back to this. Boom. Oh. So what I'm seeing, Todd, is a guy, especially a person that goes armed into the world, regardless of their profession, could learn to utilize jujitsu for exactly what we're talking about. So this technique is a hip bump sweep, right? Correct. S super basic white belt, blue belt level jujitsu, but that is super effective. Can we show them a couple times, like different angles? Yeah, it, number one is that it should be the most basic white belt techniques that you're deploying with a firearm on. It should be. It should be the most simple, core, fundamental movements. It should not be advanced, complicated movements that have you know, seven uh, steps in the, in the sequence. That's not what you want. You want as basic as possible. You want to be very simple. You want to be very efficient. And the more efficient you become, typically with time, you become the one that's more effective. A plus B equals C. You go home safe. That's it. I like it. All right, so this would be, you're down, bad guy's on top of you, you've yes. drugged me into your yeah. guard. So from here, for example. I've already got more than I bargained for. I thought I was gonna beat you up. Yes, so here, first thing is I, I protect myself and I protect myself from your arms because I don't wanna get punched. Now, I have a problem because your hairline, yes, can come forward, but you can't if I control your biceps and you can't take my gun out if I rest my elbow right there. Also, this is a monitor of sorts because as soon as you start reaching for my gun, now I know what you're going for. It's an easy transition to your wrist. And that's where I have all those options. And even when I can't move too much, I use that to create the angle, right? And we talked about before creating angles and now I'm right into that angle no matter what you're doing. And then when that doesn't work, when this shifts, watch this, when this shifts this way, where your head goes, over that way, and it feeds this guy to me, right? And then when you pull this up, it feeds that bump to me. So Boom. we went from a Kimura to a guillotine to that sweep where now you're on top. Yes, left, right, left. And from there, right, you're left, just right. raining punches on me or just holding me down as help comes. Yeah, so the circumstances will dictate the tactics there. But if I come here, I still have to worry about this. And I also have to worry about if I'm dealing with this, this hand can also work, yeah. So I still have to worry about that. And how I'm gonna do that is by controlling your shoulders. Whether I'm controlling your head and shoulder this way, now you reach this hand. You're not reaching either hand now. So there's no chance of that occurring. And I'm gonna work to boom, boom, pop, pop. Now I'm controlling this. I can get it out when I need to, but you're not coming into me because when this arm is going this way and I control this hip, you can't come this way. Right. You need this and this to come that way and this and this to go under. So it's hips and shoulders and then head control. But I can deploy and move, do whatever I need to do from this position. All right, so let's recap what we've done from the mat here. So first of all, we talked about laying on your weapon. Right? So the idea is that anytime you end up on the ground, if you're on the ground, you want to be on your weapon. You don't want your weapon exposed to your adversary. You don't want to feed him your weapon. Too often, uh, we don't think about this. So your professional opinion, um, I'm not concerned about these things because if I draw my gun, it's a real fight and I'm using it, blah, blah, blah. How often do you see in reality though, somebody, cop, good guy getting their gun taken away? It happens. So can't I just carry in a certain spot on my body and not have to worry about any of this shit? No, okay. No. So keep going. Solid no. So number one, lay your gun when you first hit the ground or as soon as you can until you can get some type of control position established or you can get back to base. Two is when you're in a position that you can't to be able to underhook the weapon system so that you can pull it back into you and it can't be extracted through you. And as Mickey noted, 
having good gear, this happens to be a Safari Land holster, who I'm not endorsing, but make good holsters, is into the belt and it's, it's looped through and the belt is solid. Uh, it's not coming out. Now, if we did this a thousand times, we might be able to get it out, but this is what we want, right? Nice, good underhook. We talked a little bit about as well, the difference between one hand pulling out and one hand sliding and underhooking because I still have play in this hand. I can still use this hand to grab, to control, to thread a wrist, to grab a belt, to pull up or to bump. I can do a lot with this. Whereas here, I can't, I've lost it. The other problem with this, for a guy that's trained on top, he has the ability to thread underneath. Okay, he can underhook your arm here and lift it up. And not only will it take it off, but it'll put you in some bad positions. So not the best of ideas. And this is what we used to do back in the old days. So that's one. And then the next thing that we talked about was trying to get back up to base. So if you're laying on your weapon here, right, trying to create some type of frame on your adversary. Sometimes they collapse it. If you can stay outside 90 degrees, that's great. That's what we want. If you can't and they start to collapse it, you're really gonna have to maintain your elbow as the frame on his body. So then just your humerus is the That's it. frame. That's it. And then my bottom elbow is gonna have to come under an index on my weapon. And as I'm doing that, I'm driving back into him. The more that I turn my shoulders past 90 degrees, the more solid I am. If my shoulders go this way and they're at 80 degrees, he's gonna flatten me out. And notice when my shoulder goes back, my weapon comes to him. Okay, so it's a big deal that I keep the shoulder forward. It's a lot like jujitsu cross side position, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got my frame, I've got my index built here. I create that space by lifting my hip up. Now once I'm here and I'm driving into him, I pull this hand back and now I've got this column to support me. And this shin is gonna paint the mat and I can come to weapon or I can come from here to standing up and doing whatever it is that I'm gonna do. I dig it. And we talked a little bit about um, doing the general kind of Kimura from here. So when the hand comes to the weapon system, locking it into place. If you're controlling, we were talking about controlling bicep and head. Once this happens, you're off the bicep or tricep and onto the wrist. If his elbow's down, I'm gonna use my knee to rock it forward, right? That knee brings it forward. Now I can thread. Once I thread no fingers, I'm on his wrist, and I'm gonna pull back with this shoulder, and as it pulls back, it straightens it out, it elongates him. So I'm pushing my feet this way, and I'm pulling my arms that way. So hips go this way, arm comes this way. Now, 45 degrees, I drive. And that shoulder is gonna come apart. Even if that gun was here, the same thing, if I was going to grab at your concealed weapon that was in an appendix, you can do the same yeah, thing. Yeah, so if this, if this is not on center, on center it's gonna be very hard to do, but let's say it's off center like true appendix carry. As long as I'm controlling here, oh, now I have a wrist lock. wrist lock. me, yeah. Yeah, now I have a wrist lock, because once you go to grab it, right? Once you go to grab it, I know what you want. And now it's gonna be very hard for you to take that out. Plus, now the gun. Turn it a little bit. Yeah, you're literally, you go, yeah. you, you'd smoke my wrist if, if Yeah, I so would. I would pull this forward and drive my chest and uh, abdominal wall forward this way. At the same time, I'm pulling the elbow out. And then now I absolutely have a Kimura lock. And of course, guys, this isn't a jujitsu video, but there's a reason that you don't see people training certain Eastern arts and winning matches. And there's a reason that that stuff doesn't work on the street and all that good stuff. This stuff works, so do it. Find a gym. How does somebody find a good gym? Just to add a side note, since we are on the mat. So my, my personal take is that it needs to be a reputable gym based on the history of that gym and the guys in that gym, in particular over time. So, you know, I'm, I'm coming from the Hicks inside, right? Uh, so I have a very tight knit bond with that group of guys, but also I would say like Henzo's guys are very solid. And you see a large percentage of guys who served in the military, a ton of law enforcement officers, a ton of reality based stuff. The guys compete in everything in MMA and Nogi and Abu Dhabis and IBJJF Jiu Jitsu with a Gi. 
and they're testing it and they're, and they're fighting and they're really working hard to ensure that it's, it's actual solid mechanics, right? I dig it. As opposed to very quick belts. Like I come in and six years later I'm a black belt or whatever, whatever they're doing now. So mm -hmm. that's the best way for me is. So look at the gym's website, contact the owner, ask them some questions. There's What's some your people lineage? That know. Pe people typically know. Like if you, if you find a couple guys in the business and let's say you talk to six people and five of the six people recommended it based on the same general reasons that you're looking for a school, that's the one to go with, right? I dig it. Hope you guys are digging this series. We're working really hard at it. Todd's super sweaty. You can see he's out of shape. Mm. Couple things that you gotta keep in mind. This stuff is not watch a video and you know the technique. This stuff is drill it until the day you leave this earth if you wanna be good at it. In the context of how your body changes with age, your, your uh, strength, flexibility, stamina, all of that's gonna change how you would be able to deploy or employ these, these techniques. So you would constantly train them throughout your life, just like going for a walk. You need to continually do it and uh, do it with different uh, uh, training partners too, because Todd and I are about the same size. You get somebody Drew's size that's got 20 pounds on us and is a couple inches taller, it's gonna change the dynamic or vice versa. Somebody like our wives size would totally change it as well. So food for thought. Hope you're digging this shit. How do they find you? Uh, my website for business is tourprotection.com. My email is info at tourprotection.com. On Instagram, I'm at tour training. Find him, sign up for a class. Don't be dickheads. Look for the next video here in the series on retaining weapons with Mr. Todd Fox.